that McKean Henderson knew Matthew. They didn't know each other. And I'll address that issue later because I know there was some speculation also that it was a drug deal gone bad. I'll tell you where all that came from. So they're eyeing up Matt. So they were whispering and talking and they conjured up a story to go over to Matt and act like they were gay. They also saw that Matt was wearing some nice clothes, so they thought they could rob him and take his money. And to let you know, the only thing they got out of Matt in this whole murder was 20 bucks. The bartender thought it was really odd when they came in that McKinney and Henderson were paying for the beer with dimes, nickels, and quarters. It's another shot out of the beer, the bar, excuse me. So they're in there talking. They, they had gone into the bathroom to conjure up this story, by the way. McKinney, McKinney had uh, his father's truck. Now, these two guys, I just want to let you know, they're a little bit of their background. Uh, McKinney's mother um, had botched, she was a nurse and she had some medical issues and had a botched surgery happen in which there was a lawsuit and she died. And he ended up getting $100,000 from this botched surgery from his mother passing away. He ended up spending it on, mostly on cars and drugs. He was a big crystal meth user. Henderson, um, he, his, mother, his mother didn't really care too much about him and passed him on to his grandparents, in which his, um, before that all happened, his mother's boyfriend used to take advantage of him, beat him up, smack him around, and there was some abuse that was going on. Henderson, in all of this mess, did not beat Matthew. But he was a third, one of those we call the third party bystander that did nothing to prevent this. Had he stepped in and stopped McKinney from beating him, that kid probably would have been alive today. Same goes for our current bullying situation that we have in our, a lot of our schools. Instead of kids being Steven Spielberg and foaming it to go on YouTube, you need to put the phones down and step in and say, no, this is not right. And I'm sure with your careers you're going into, you're going to encounter a lot of that. I don't see it happening in the near future. And with our current way of the world, the things are right now, and our legal system, and also with our elected officials, it's not getting any better. I wish it was. It's not getting a whole lot better. So McKinney and Henderson talked Matt into getting into his pickup truck, and they drove him out of town on the east. They, they said they were going to give him a ride home. They got to a point when they were by the Walmart and McKinney said, by the way, we're gonna tell you, we're not gay and you've been jacked. And then McKinney started beating Matt up in the car with a 357 revolver, the butt end of it. And Matt was begging for his life. They drove in this neighborhood called Sherman Hills. Now you can see it's kind of spotty houses in there. It's pretty grown up now, but um, a lot more houses. But see that house directly in the background here? I'm gonna point this out later in another slide. So they drove this truck around, they got out into the prairie, and you have to understand, people say, well, how did they know where to go? Well, Henderson grew up in this area out in Sherman Hills. This was their, like their playground. So for a lot of us, you know, if you were a hunter or whatever you did, this is your playground. You went out there and kind of horsed around. You know, when I was a kid, I used to play in the woods all the time build forts and all sorts of crazy stuff and come home with poison ivy. That's kind of what they did. That was their playground. This is the fence. This is the actual spot. I got several photographs of this where they tied Matt up to the fence. So they dragged him up to the fence and it, at first a lot of the reports and the media said he was driving like the, um, he was, sorry, he was tied up like he was Jesus Christ. Kind of like that. And he was not. His hands were behind his back. This fence is a split rail fence. It serves no purpose of anything other than to identify the property, maybe to keep some cattle in, but it really serves no purpose other than kind of where the lines are. So it's kind of a unique looking fence. He was tied up to that and they started beating Matt up. They took his shoes off so he couldn't run away. And stupid, they threw his shoes in the back of the pickup truck. They also took his wallet and his ID and they put it on the dash in the truck. So they start beating him with the butt end of this, of this revolver. There's nobody out there. There's nobody out in the prairie to hear you scream. 
other than that house that was far away, but it's so far away they couldn't hear what was going on. Now, mind you, we're now into October 7th, just after midnight. This is high exactly. desert. Is this high desert? Like it's like kind of warm during the day, but it's ice cold at night. This is hot. I've been in high desert, yeah. and it's different from low desert. <laughs> no, like it's got kind, of, kind of like like I'm going out to show my film in Palm Springs in a couple of weeks. So if you go out to Joshua Tree, yep. um, it, it's nicer in the day, but it's cold as hell, you know, at night time. So it was, you know, and this is October. We're into October eighth now, or October seventh. So Matt was beat up, and one of the things that he said to McKinney, and by the way, Henderson's watching this whole thing, other than Henderson tying him up, and, and, and he was afraid of McKinney, so he wanted to kind of go along with his buddy. So McKinney really beat the shit out of him, threw the shoes away, and why do you think he took his shoes off of Matt? So he couldn't run across that ground. Right, so he couldn't run away. And the last thing that Matt said to him the last thing that really smashed his skull is, is Matt said to McKinney, you know what I'm going to do when I get out of here? I'm going to tell on both of you. And that's what sealed the deal. McKinney turned around and hit him one last time in the head and crushed his skull. In. But Matt was still alive. And, and just to kind of give you an idea where everything's at, the University of Wyoming is kind of that way. Past the hill. All of these rocks here used to form a cross. So after Matt was killed, people came out and put this cross in. And I have to tell you, as a gay man, I was reading a really good book. If you ever want to read a really good book about Laramie and this murder, it's called Losing Matt Shepard by Beth Lafreda. And I was in a, in a really shitty hotel room. Uh, it was not a good hotel room to do a speaking gig there. And I finished that book, and uh, I think I have this with me. And I met with this guy named Jim Osborne, a really big guy, who was in charge of the LGBT group uh, when Matt was there. And he gave me this when I met him. It looks like a treasure map. I've had this since that day. And, he, and I said, I would like to go and see where Matt was killed. And he goes, you're doing that under being at the risk of being arrested. We were sitting in the school cafeteria, and he set it down in front of him, and he slid it over to him. And he said, I'm not going to give you any more interactions but other than that. So I just finished this book on Matt's murder, and I'm going to a spot where a huge gay rights movement has now started and continues to happen. I am out there by myself, and I, I cried. It's quiet. You kind of wonder what the hell went on. Um, I, I was shaking a little bit. I, I had all these different emotions going on. Um, and I ended up taking one of those rocks that sits on my desk now, that was part of that cross that sits on my desk in, at home in my office, to remind me how fortunate I am to be doing what I'm doing throughout the country speaking. There's the rocks there. So after they beat Matt up, um, oh, by the way, this is our director, but this is Jim Osborne, who was, a, who was the uh, leader of the LGBT group back there. So after they beat, a lot of people don't know about this, but after they beat up Matt, they went to 7th and Harney, the Kenny and Henderson did. Now mind you, they have the blood all over them of Matt. They left this kid out the fence, he's still alive. And they meet up with these two shady characters named Morales and Herrera. And a fight happens. Because Morales and Herrera are, are two amazing people in the community. I'm being sarcastic here. Because they were, at that area in the community, trying to bust into people's homes and cars. And so this fight happens. And what happens is uh, McKinney picks up the gun they had just beat up Matt with and, and hit him across the head here and almost killed this guy. And McKinney had a bunch of scars and a big gash on his head too. And the police shows up and everybody scatters except for Henderson. He's standing there. So the police show up, Sergeant Debris shows up, and he said, what's going on here? And he goes, oh, we just had a fight. Now, mind you, they're in a pickup truck covered with blood in the back. Matt's shoes are in the back. There's ID sitting in the, in the cab of the truck, and they see the gun in the back of the pickup. The 
police does. And the police said to Henderson, I hope that we're not going to find uh, anybody with a bullet in them after tonight. And, and Henderson laughed. He said, oh, you don't worry, officer. There's nobody with a hole in them. Of course there wasn't, because they didn't shoot him. They beat him with a gun. This is Henderson. This is McKinney. So what happened after that? At 6.30 that evening, a bicycler, Aaron Trifles, is riding his bike. There's a bike trail that goes out in that prairie. And he sees what he thinks looks like a scarecrow on the fence. It wasn't. It was Matt Shepard. So, so the bicycler, he's riding his bike on private property, too, subject yeah, to be arrested. I mean, it sounds like everybody goes out there. It's kind of like places aren't around here. It's private property, but everybody does it. It became private property. Um, a couple of year, a year or so after uh, Matt's murder, because so many people were coming out. Yeah, good question. So meanwhile, so Henderson gets arrested, gets taken in for questioning. McKinney goes home. I'm backing up here a little bit. McKinney goes home and he tells his girlfriend, "I think we just built, uh, killed a faggot on the fence." And he's got all these clothes in. He's got Matt's wallet with him, by the way. So his girlfriend takes the wallet that they stole from Matt that's covered with blood. She puts it in a soiled diaper and shoves it in the trash. Now, 6.30 that evening, Matt's body is found, and they take it to the hospital. He gets admitted to Ivinson Hospital at 9 o'clock. This is a weird set of circumstances. McKinney's head is so badly hurt and damaged and bleeding that his girlfriend takes him to the hospital to have it checked out. He's in there, and the curtain is drawn, and guess who's on the other side of the curtain? Matthew Shepard, who he had just beat the shit out of on the other side, you know, on the fence that was right next door. Meanwhile, Henderson's girlfriend is trying to cover up for him um, from everything that's going on because he shared the story. He gets let out, by the way, from questioning. McKinney's girlfriend, she dumps him off at the hospital. She drives an hour east to where her mother lives and she has got a storage locker to hide the bloody clothes that McKinney was um, having. So right now, what is she guilty of? Complicity. What's that? Tampering with evidence. So now we've just included two females, girlfriends, that are with these guys that are now in just as much trouble. This is McKinney's girlfriend right here. This is during the court trial. So during uh, when they first got read what's going on. This is what Matt looked like in the hospital room. If he would have survived, he would have been um, just most of the time in a coma or just laying there coma shops most of the time. I mean, his brain was affected. His brain stem was smashed and everything. Now, mind you, this kid was robbed and beaten and called a faggot. And they did that for 20 bucks. What happened is the whole country went absolutely crazy when they found out and the gay community rallied together, allies gathered together while Matt was still begging, you know, hanging on for his life. In 48 hours, McKinney and Henderson were sentenced for this crime. It was a mess. There was so much evidence, it was unbelievable. And the, all these vigils were happening all across the United States, everywhere. At the funeral, when Matt died on October 12th, the funeral was a few days later, and this is um, Judy Shepard and her husband are out at the funeral. It was a, a really horrible day raining. The Westboro Baptist Church shows up. They run a, a website called GodHatesFags.com. I got a chance before I leave here, I'll show you the website. They have a perpetual memorial on their website from Matthew Shepard that shows his head bobbing in flames. They created that about four days after Matt died. 
Now, how would you like to be the parents and see your child's head bobbing in flames on a website, on a hate website? Also, when they were speaking to the press here outside the funeral, this is when the protest was going on. Dennis Shepard was wearing a bulletproof vest because there was threats on his life um, during this whole time, mainly by white supremacy groups and other people that just didn't like the queers. So what happened here is a few college students came up with the idea of being angels, and they came and had these angel wings, and what they did is they covered up the protesters, all these rotten signs that were right behind them. This is during the funeral of your child, okay? So you're seeing all this happen and transpire. But this is what was going on behind them. This man is no longer alive, um, Reverend Phelps, but his, his family, because he's taught his family how to hate, he taught his grandchildren how to hate. It's all learned. Learn in the family, the media doesn't help it sometimes too. But he's behind them, and I remember I interviewed this one girl who had short hair, she was straight, but he assumed that she was a lesbian, and she was holding the angel wings up, and he was breathing down her neck, calling her a dirty lesbian, while she was standing up there protecting the shepherds during the funeral. I thought that was just horrible. But these are the kind of signs. They come in your community, they call it a love crusade, they'll protest on stuff. They love the media. It has nothing to do with anything Christian. And people will sue them, they usually win, and that's how they fund their love crusades. They've been doing this for over 20 years. Who do you think these kids are that travel with them? Who? Their grandchildren. So not only has Reverend Phelps taught his children how to hate, you're now teaching your grandchildren how to hate. Now, with the work that you're going into, do you want to run into that? Is that the kind of community that you want to service? Is that the community that you want to have when you're, when you're creating the, the safety and will for everybody? I don't think so. That's the grandchildren. So when the media came on to Laramie, they went to the Albany County Courthouse when all this was going on, there were so many media trucks that were there, from CNN to NBC, that they had to repave the parking lot because everybody, because it was raining and a really bad time. Everything was sinking into the parking lot. There was so much stuff. And, and granted, how would you like to be in Parkersburg and all of a sudden the whole world is kind of on your community. You can go anywhere without seeing TV cameras in you. I mean, you, it's a terrible feeling in your community. And, and then that's what you're being known for as a place where a hate crime happened, not for a beautiful community. These are just some images that went around um, that are very, you know, very well known to Matt, especially, I would probably say, um, this one you've seen on a lot of different kind of posters and things. McKinney and Henderson are serving two consecutive life sentences at two different prisons in Wyoming. I'm going to address the drug issue thing. These are, this was on a, a Newsweek cover uh, after Matt died. There is a bench at the Laramie, Wyoming, and also a uh, some money for people that are going into international affairs uh, to help them out. But there's a bench that you can sit there. It's kind of a dedication outside the building that I used to go to. That's basically all that's there. There's no memorial out where the fence was at. Uh, Judy Shepard, his mom, has never been out to the fence. She says, I don't feel I need to go out there. Who would want to go out there? Um, if you're a mother or a father. And there's other people that have been murdered. The transgender community still is a problem of, of being murdered. It happens all the time now. Uh, gay people, if you're not out and you have a hate crime against you, you may not say anything because you don't want to be afraid of being outed or being fired at work or whatever it may be, and you still can. West Virginia is a beautiful state to be in, but there's so much and, uh, no discrimination laws in your state for anything. You can even, uh, it's even okay to have conversion therapy if you think you can convert your child from being gay or lesbian to a straight person, in which they do a lot of things that are awful. Conversion therapy is still accepted. That's a picture of Judy and I, just uh, my website as well. 
I'm going to address the issue that, um, and then I'll give you any uh, questions. I'm going to try to bring up that website too. The reason why there was some speculation that was a drug deal gone bad was from a 2020, remember, you know the show 2020, the news? Okay. They came to Laramie in 2004. And they were, and we were in Laramie in 2008. So we got all this information firsthand from um, the detective that covered the whole, from Dave O'Malley, the detective in the whole Matthew Shepard case. And we talked to some townspeople as well. So what had happened, it was uh, raiding sweeps. And so 2020 came to Laramie, Wyoming to interview some people. And they wanted to find out if it was a drug deal gone bad. They interviewed a guy named Doc, who was a limo driver. He's actually featured as a character in the Laramie Project. And Doc was interviewed on national TV. Um, and you can see this all on uh, YouTube if you bring it up. And he was interviewed, and he talked about Matt, because he used to bring Matt around the limo or take him to a, a gay bar uh, about an hour away, because there was no gay bars in uh, Laramie. And he talked about how they were all buddy buddies. And, and he said he thought it was a drug deal gone bad, that uh, him and Henderson and McKinney knew each other. They didn't. I have to tell you, their credibility on the people that they interviewed for the show was horrible. Doc was the biggest crystal meth distributor and user in Laramie County. And shortly after this 2020 uh, report came out on national TV, he's disappeared. Still haven't found him. We don't know where he went. It wasn't the most credible source. Elizabeth Vargas on 2020 met with Dave O'Malley with her producer. They came in and Dave O'Malley, the police chief, said, well, what are you interviewing me for? What do you want to know? Because we, we've had the meeting here before. And she said, well, we want to pursue it just to talk about that. He goes, well, I'm not going to talk about it if you think it's a drug deal gone bad. She goes, oh, no, no, we're not going to ask any kind of questions like that. She came with her producer to Dave O'Malley's house. And in the course of the conversation, about eight minutes into the interview, which was being filmed, Elizabeth Vargas asked Dave O'Malley, so tell me about this botched uh, murder that you reported on, that you investigated, and how was the drug deal gone bad? Dave O'Malley couldn't believe it. He shut the, the whole interview off, asked him to leave his house. They ended up leaving. But Elizabeth Vargas left a document on his kitchen table from the producer of 2020 that said, we want you to pursue this interview as if it was a drug deal gone bad. It's raining sweeps. She's pulling out of Laramie, Wyoming in her car to go back to Denver to get in the airport. Dave O'Malley calls her on the phone and said, I just want to let you know, you left the document in my house and read it to her, you know, read to her what it was, she turned around and came back to get it. It was also in the document that the producer of 2020 was in cahoots with Henderson's lawyer. They were friends and they wanted to let Henderson off to see if he could get the sentence lessened a little bit to get him out of prison on parole. So it was all kind of intermingled and tied in. It was not a drug deal on that, but when it's all said and done, you have a family whose son was killed in Laramie, Wyoming. You have somebody that's not around anymore. And we've seen murders like this happen. Some never get reported. You may hear something, and some get kind of brushed under. But again, it played out like the best movie ever. And it was because the kid was white, gay, petite, and it happened in Calvary country. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. I am going to bring up the website real quick so you can check this out. Does anybody have any questions? How many of you knew about this murder before I came, before the, your instructor ever said anything? A couple of you. Okay. Can, you can, you tell them, can you tell them something about uh, what the Matthew uh, Shepard Project does now with the money they have received? Sure. Uh, the Matthew Shepard Foundation. Foundation, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, 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 sorry. The Matthew Shepard Foundation, what they do.
Uh, what happens now that Judy Shepard does, I work for the foundation uh, off and on, but they go out in communities, they talk about math, they talk about anti-bullying. Um, you have to understand that 20 years have passed, and a lot of, a, a lot of issues with the LGBTQ community um, has changed. I was just talking on lunch that, you know, 20 years ago, uh, I was talking about coming out stories, and my own coming out um, to audiences 20 years ago, 25 years ago. And now, college students don't care to hear about it. You know, they've heard it all. Well, this is a really unique story. It's more talking about bias, bias crime, hate, hate crimes, um, bullying, what we can do as a community. What is your legacy going to be? What kind of community do you want to live in? Those kinds of things uh, are more important. And how, as young adults, you're going to go out into the world and create that community and be better people and more positivity. Because Honestly, right now in our world, we need it. Um, I, mean, I don't know about you, but every day I wake up and I kind of wonder what, what else is going on and what else is near. Um, craziness. And, um, you know, we get a lot of that stuff on social media and on Facebook. Not all of it is true. I don't want to use the term fake news, but just be careful of the news sources where you're getting all this information from. This is the website that the Westboro Baptist Church runs. And it's changed over the years, but uh, again, they call this uh, a love crusade when they go to their picketing schedule to your community. So you could be doing like the Laramie Project. I could be speaking at a school, which they've come and, and protested at some of my events. At gay pride parades, uh, if a soldier has come back from Iraq that's dead, and maybe uh, they were LGBT, or maybe they were just open-minded, and they, you know, they were doing something within their unit or whatever to create community, and they caught wind of that. It's just volatile. And it's just the members of the group. It's not an actual church. I'm not bashing any churches in here. I'm a spiritual person, but this, to me, is not saying out any love and friendship out in the world. So what happens here, it, you know, if you're a young kid looking for some kind of support and you ran across this on a website and you're already being bullied at school, this doesn't do you any good at all. Because we need to have more of our students validated and felt like a regular human being no special rights, we just want to feel like we fit in and are part of everything. So he goes on here, and let's say he goes over to the archive section, and then he clicks on the, the classic Matthew Shepard Perpetual Memorial. This is what's on here, folks. This has been on here since Matt died, and uh, a few days after. So if you were Judy Shepard, and you go on a website and you see your son who was murdered by two people and then he's on this website bobbing in flames and it says how long your child has been in hell. Is that the kind of community you want to service? Is that the kind of energy that you want to put out in the world? I don't think so. You had another one on there. There's a couple others on there. For There's a lesbian that was mauled by a pit bull that they thought was amusing and thought it was the devil coming and doing a the good work of the Lord to maul this lesbian and kill her. Just crazy, crazy stuff. Um, there's an audio file here. It wasn't on here earlier, but um, uh, yeah. there's an audio file in here, and, it, and it's actually the voice of this group or one of the members that says, for God's sakes, listen to Phelps. It's Reverend Phelps' son. So it's supposed to be Matt yelling out of the hell. Didn't come up earlier, so let me click on this. Yeah, no, I thought I heard it. Yeah, longer. Anyway, that's basically. Uh, if you want to share more positive websites and stuff like that, and, and a lot of them are out there. There's 1,600 extremist groups in our country. Um, hate groups. You have four major ones here in West Virginia and they're all white supremacy groups, a lot of KKK stuff. And those are the ones that are disidentified. So I wish you a lot of luck. Mull over what I had to talk about today. And, uh, and you know, I wish you well in your careers and everything. Just put that good energy out in the world. Be more accepting. I don't like to use the word tolerant, because to me, tolerance is telling me you're putting up with something. But be more accepting in your teachings and what you're doing for your children and your community members. And, uh, the people that you're dealing with, because you're dealing with all kinds of people. You know, not just the straight community, but you're dealing with all kinds. And I have to remind myself that too, when I do. Okay. Okay.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.